Yeah, welcome back to Think Talk. Uh, this is Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a given Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. And um, we are still uh, memorializing, commemorating 9-11. And we have a show for you that uh, you probably haven't heard a lot of this before. Um, General Dan Figleaf uh, was in the Pentagon. He is uh, one of our hosts. He has a couple of shows, Figment shows on uh, think tech and um, he's kind enough to join us today to tell us about his personal experience and personal perspective on 9 11 in the pentagon um you know we've seen a lot of footage and we've seen a lot of analysis of what happened in manhattan um, but we haven't seen as much of what happened in the pentagon so this will be um this will be more information perhaps than we ever heard before about the pentagon uh thank you so much dan for appearing this morning you bet, Jay. Happy to be here. Man, so, happy to be a think tech host. <laughs> I know it's good. It's all good, mutually good. It's all good. Um, so, uh, Dan, tell us, tell us uh, about your uh, experience. You were, I assume, you were a general officer at the time in the Pentagon in 9/11. Um, where had you been um, before that, and what were you doing in the Pentagon? Well, I was a, a new, relatively new one star in the uh, Air Force operate on the Air Force operations staff in the Pentagon. My previous assignment, I'd been an F-16, actually a, a combined wing commander during the air war over Serbia, Kosovo is known to some. So I'd come from a combat environment to what I thought would be peaceful and sedate Washington, D.C. Uh, on the operations staff, I was uh, kind of in charge of the future of the Air Force. I was the, the director of operational requirements. So we looked at the future and looked at threats, and I was in my office on the E-ring, but um, probably two-thirds of the way around from where the aircraft eventually struck when I saw the first aircraft hit the World Trade Center on a news report. Did you know at that moment, then <clears throat> there was a problem? I mean, a lot of people felt, well, it was a small plane, maybe a Piper Cub, who knows? Uh, only one building, could be an accident, just an anomaly. Did you know at that instant moment there was an attack? No, I didn't, and called the other couple majors who worked in my outer office, I called them and we watched it and watched the reports that kind of went through exactly what you said, was it an accident? It was the clearest day ever, as many have said. And so that didn't make sense, but it didn't make sense, uh, was the bottom line. The, um, I went back to preparing to brief the brand new Secretary of the Air Force, Jim Roach, on the F-22. That was next on my uh, schedule that morning. And I looked up from the papers I was reviewing and saw the second plane dig in to a turn to hit the second tower. And at that moment, it was clear it was intentional. And I knew we were under attack. Wow. So what, what were your thoughts, uh, what were your actions? What were the thoughts and actions of the people around you in the Pentagon? Because if you recognize it, I'm sure other people yeah. had the same snap judgment on what was going on. Yeah, and, and I wish my recollections were clear, um, but there are two things, it's all kind of blurred. And secondly, I have a hard time even looking at the a real bona fide chronology to say what happened when, but, in essence, we all migrated to our crisis action center, our operations center in a lower level of the Pentagon, uh, we being the Air Force key staff and leaders. And I don't remember that being directed. I think it was, you know, just kind of the natural thing to do. And so we went down there and began looking at uh, what was happening and trying to figure out what was happening in an immediate sense, were there more hijacked aircraft? I, I believe it came pretty known pretty quickly that these aircraft had been hijacked. And we had a cable news network up on the big TV in a conference room that probably held 20 to 30 people. Um, and we're trying to figure things out. What was the mood in the room? I mean, me, I, I, I recall coming to the conclusion that the world is changing right in front of my eyes. It will never be the same. And I, you know, a certain amount of anxiety. What about, what about the generals in the room with you? Well, there, there wasn't uh, time for anxiety, frankly. You know, there's work to do, figure out what's happening, figure out what to do about it and account for our personnel. That wasn't yet a problem because the Pentagon hadn't been struck. 
there was, I never saw any chaos in the Pentagon. I was not near the, the wedge that was hit, uh, but it, it was very orderly. Uh, we had a large group of uh, more junior people who kind of migrated down to the crisis action center and they were all clustered outside. And I'd say there was more, probably more anxiety there because they didn't have anything to do. Um, but we were just going through that process when we saw the uh, report that the Pentagon had been hit. And this is the way I remember it, Jay, but I don't remember hearing or feeling anything when the aircraft struck the Pentagon. It's a big, very well-structured building. It was kind of on the other side of it, but I'd been near a major ammo dump explosion in Raul Pindi, Pakistan in 1988, and that was a religious experience. So my first thought was, how, how can this be true? I didn't hear it, I didn't feel it. And then the alarms went off and smoke and fumes started entering our spaces. Wow, and, and I guess it was time for evacuation. Uh, not really, we had work to do. And uh, the, I, the first action I remember was somebody standing on the conference table, ripping the fire alarm out of the ceiling and cutting one of the wires to it with a scissors so we could talk. So um, there, there wasn't any indication of significant fire or damage near near our space so we kept working um we prepared for evacuation i, I went out um again i'm on the operations staff we had planners and acquisition and logistics so i don't know if somebody told me to do this or it came to mind uh from my own experience in a house fire as a young boy and uh told all these people who are clustered around to make a human chain down the hallway to the exit and get on the floor so they'd be below any smoke and they could guide the whoever was evacuating out down this labyrinth of, of uh, hall hallway to the the exit by the visibility the was guy. being affected i think so you certainly could smell it and, and um that was that was disconcerting uh, because we were several uh, two levels down, I guess, from ground level, and uh, smoke is bad. I'd experienced it before. I didn't like it, but we have work to do. What What did that smoke smell like? It smelled like death, burning jet fuel and death. And you know, the, if you've smelled it before, you know the smell. Wow. Um, and I, you know, I can't prove that, that that's just, that was the first thing I thought. Yeah. Okay. So tell me what happened then. So now we know we're under attack. And at this point, the uh, uh, secretary of the air force and the new chief of staff, of the air force, the key leaders were both down in the conference room. They had been uh, in, uh, in their respective offices only days, one day and two days. I, I forget who had just one day. So uh, I knew the chief. I didn't know Secretary Roach well yet, though I later would, of course. But um, so we had to decide what to do. How do we maintain continuity of operations, keep command and control uh, at the headquarters Air Force? How do we account for our personnel? And do we evacuate? And at some point, the decision was made to evacuate from the Pentagon. There were helicopters available from Bo Boeing, Bowling Air Force Base across the Potomac. And it was decided that the Air Force senior leadership, and as a one star, it was not senior leadership in the Pentagon, um, would move over to our command post there. And I was directed to go up and organize that movement from the river helipad up by the river entrance. And uh, that was because I had some background that had helicopter units when I was a group commander. And so I grabbed another cell phone because I wasn't sure my personal one would work and went up to the river entrance. Jay, I'll say, share one sort of aside there. I, the only time I felt really fearful was going out the entrance to go up to the helipad. And I was scared to death that the Washington Monument, which it was right there, wouldn't be standing. Now, that's irrational, but it, that was the sense of magnitude of the day. 
and thankfully it was, but that that was a deep seated fear when I opened the door uh, to exit the Pentagon into that beautiful day. And, well, at this point, you knew there had been a double attack in Manhattan, and was, one on and one on uh, the Pentagon, of course. And I mean, now it's clear. There's smoke, and there's when I went out, there were medical gauze pads blowing in the wind like snowflakes, and um, yeah, yeah. So we knew we were under attack. There was no question. Do you know about Flight 93 into Pennsylvania or coming coming to the Capitol at that point? No, I, I learned about that kind of later. The While there wasn't chaos in a human sense and in an information sense, it was absolute chaos and we were trying to sort two things. So while I was up getting, uh, we got four Hueys in from over at Bowling Air Force Base. I'm waiting to move the... the uh, the uh, senior leaders up from this command post to the helicopters to take them to bowling. I've finally gotten through on a cell phone. I stayed on that line for command and control for a couple of hours. It's the only link we had. Um, two of the Defense Protective Services guards came running up to me. And by now they had kind of had Kevlar on haphazardly and had their long guns and um, they came running up to me said, sir, there's a, another aircraft headed towards Washington, D.C. What do we do? And then they just froze. They, they just, so I grabbed one of them by a collar and I said, well, if you see an airplane, you get behind that wall and you get behind that wall. I, I don't know. What else are you doing? Tell that. But, but and at this so point, now my concern is know. we've got, no, we, we did not know, but that made sense. I mean, it's certainly rational, have it, given the events that unfolded, that another airplane would be headed to Washington, D.C. And now I've got these helicopters exposed and I'm about to expose the secretary chief and other senior leaders to get them to the helicopter. So that was kind of a quick decision make matrix to run through with the op center and we decided to evacuate them. Well, one of the factors had to be that uh, whether there was one identifiable uh, third, uh, fourth air aircraft coming in is that the country itself was under attack, um, and that you did not have information to establish one way or the other uh, whether this was an attack in other places, in other ways, no? No, we, did, we didn't know that. It made sense that there were other aircraft that were hijacked, and, and frankly, for a couple hours after the attack and after we moved the key leaders over to the other command post at Bowling, we've spent a lot of time sorting through were there were there more? Were there still more? As as you know, they quickly emptied the national airspace, really a remarkable accomplishment. But let me say, Jay, that that was not our responsibility at the air staff. The air staff is not an operational headquarters at the Pentagon. People sometimes forget that. That was responsibility of First Air Force down at, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. What about the president? Was he on your radar, so to speak? Um, he was in terms of news reports. So we knew he, where he was at the time of the attack. We knew they were moving him, but that movement wasn't was something we kept awareness of, but we weren't controlling. Hmm. He went to a SAC base, as I recall. He went to Barksdale Air Force Base first in Louisiana, stopped there relatively briefly, and then to Offutt. And there was, of course, debate about do you bring, bring him back into the mix. Um, I remember knowing of that debate, but not not being part of it. Was there a scramble that morning, Dan? There were. Uh, okay, in fact, I've got a picture on uh, the wall <laughs> that's right over there, be in the other room. A uh, beautiful uh, print of an oil painting of an F-16 over the burning Pentagon that was given to me as a gift um, that I don't like very much because, yeah, we responded, but it didn't work. So I don't know that we should celebrate failure. You know, it's, it's something I, every time I look at it, I think, too late. So that was the, too the, late. The, the, the intention of the scramble was to catch another plane, another hijack plane, and shoot, shoot them down. Yes? Yes. I mean, that's a little oversimplified, but yes, there was a debate about should we scramble, then they did scramble, then what authorities do they have and what do they do, and there's 
there's plenty out there on the web to hear the stories of the pilots and those involved as controllers in that mission. And I recall too, that when the Pentagon was evacuated, there were virtually thousands of people. <laughs> the Pentagon has a lot of staff in it. <clears throat> and um, they were all out on this grassy lawn overlooking the Pentagon at, at some distance, looked like 100, 200 yards. Uh, what was happening out there? Yeah, I mean, they, well, I, I wasn't there, uh, but I did see people evacuating. It was very orderly. And I think by and large, many of them evacuated to the south of the Pentagon, the south parking lot, and uh, in fairly large number got in their vehicles and left, I think. Um, but the Pentagon was not truly evacuated. Secretary Rumsfeld never left. I have an inside story on that that I don't think's ever been told publicly. Um, but at the air staff, while we evacuated our senior leaders, many of us stayed in the Pentagon and kept working the, the issues, if you will. Um, and while the building burned for a number of days, I, uh, uh, that's another of the DVD quality memories that I have is going driving by the building as it still burned. Um, but so the, the Pentagon was not evacuated. Many people were, but it wasn't in full and the operate the staffs kept operating. A comment on the architecture. You know, it's unique architecture. It's the military. Um, do you have any thoughts, uh, did you have any thoughts uh, about the architecture and the, the resilience of that structure as against this kind of attack? Um, yeah, it was designed as a hospital, as you probably know, and then converted to our major military headquarters, five rings with space between each of them. A really remarkable building. I like to say I hated that building before because I'm not, I'm not made to work in Washington, D.C., and I loved it on September 12th or the 11th already because it it survived so well. As I said, I didn't even sense the impact. Um, one of the strokes of great fortune for those of us in the building, probably for the nation, is that the one uh, wing that they hit, the wedge, there are different wedges around the Pentagon, was, uh, I think, the first one to be renovated, uh, including strength and structure and glass and everything else and modern uh, fire suppression equipment. And uh, that was a, going to be a sequential, sequential renovation, but that's where it was struck, and that limited the death and damage to some degree. Was that building destroyed or partially destroyed? Well, it wasn't a separate building, it, but it, it, it cut like a knife through it. And, and it was rebuilt and the best thing you do, it, it looked like it looks like a, a, a slice of cake, but a thin slice has been taken out of it. How much loss of life was there that day in the Pentagon? A hundred and some plus those on Flight 77, the aircraft that hit. Yeah. That was and, pretty and scary. There were, you know, more than 2,000, including over 400, I think, first responders in, in New York. So, as you said at the outset, that gets a little more attention. That's understandable. Yeah. So what, is, what does it mean for an attack to be made on the Pentagon? There's something, you know, yes, they made it, a sim, it was sim, symbolic. It was against Wall Street. And yes, uh, Flight 93 was probably intended for what, the White House or Congress? Capital uh, is what's generally okay. speculated. Yeah. Um, and that was, that, that, had, that its own you know, bizarre circumstances. And I would like to talk to you about that. Um, but um, the one against the Pentagon is, it's more than just symbolic. I mean, they intended to disrupt command control and the, um, the, the military in general, right? I don't know. I can't presume the intent of, of, uh, of the hijackers and planners. Um, I don't know if their primary intent was symbolism or primary intent was operational impact. I would, I would guess it was more symbolism. That is the symbol of American military power to much of the world. Flight 93 um, was pointed at the Capitol coming in from the West. Mm -hmm. um, and that would have been um, a scramble possibility. 
Uh, yeah, they, it departed later. It was delayed for some reason. So they may have successfully intercepted Flight 93 if it had gotten towards the National Capital Region. But it wasn't close enough at, at, uh, at the time it, 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 it crossed right. over Shanksville. Right, it was not. Yeah. But had it proceeded towards the Capitol, who knows, we may have had an, in, an intercept. Those those people who uh, uh, over 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 overcame the uh, terrorists on that plane are true heroes. Imagine, you know. Yeah, and it, and I don't. Yeah, I don't know that they're any different from the people on the other three flights. They had the advantage of knowing through their phone calls to loved ones and to I think to airline work centers what had already happened. So you know, this, this as this unfolded on the other three flights. Who knows what they thought until the moment that they started diving at the at the buildings they struck. Yeah, can you imagine? But let's let's look at you for a, another moment, uh, Dan. Right. So you have a special perspective, uh, perspective of a longtime senior officer in the Air Force, perspective of being there, a perspective of, of um, going to that uh, briefing room with the others. Uh, and being part of the, you know, uh, Air Force response team, if you will, mm -hmm. military response team, and trying to figure out what had happened and what to do. What what is your perspective? Uh, how how do you feel now? Um, you know, I myself, I I have a, a perspective, uh, even though it's based in in Hawaii. But what is yours? Um. I think that I'll share my perspective now, and I don't know that it's changed much. Um, first of all, I have a job to do, right? I, I have work to do. I, I, we got the folks evacuated. I came back into the Pentagon. We were doing the task of figuring out how many, uh, were there any other airplanes? You know, the immediate response, uh, what was next and accounting for all Air Force personnel who had been assigned in the Pentagon. We were able to do that pretty quickly. So I had to do that. Then I was uh, told that I'd be the first night crisis action team director. So we had the center node for command and control is a crisis action team. Um, and because I was on the operations staff, somebody, probably my boss, the three star said, okay, beg you're going to be the the first night cap team director. So get back to bowling, which is where my house was anyway, where I lived at the time. And so I went and did that. And then we just continued Air Force operations, figuring out what had happened, what was currently happening, and then beginning to plan the response. And, um, and, and I did that for I think two months as opposed to my operational requirements job. So I, I basically worked for two months, not 24 seven, but close to it, just doing, doing the work of keeping the Air Force running with a big team of people. I, I'm just a one-star man, you know, I'm just doing my job. How did Air Force operations change that day? Um, well, we, we had a very specific uh, attack and threat to deal with, and that became more of our focus. And uh, generally, the Pentagon is more long-term focused than near-term focused. I, I can't, I, you know, I haven't been on active duty since 2008, I retired then. So I, I'm not sure what the environment is now, but we tra we transitioned much more to looking at the near, the now and near term and what we're going to do about it, as well as uh, being hypersensitive almost to a fault to the potential for follow on attacks. And that's a big I change. I told you that uh, we had a number of questions that came in yeah. that have come in on the show and I want to pepper them to you. I, I, uh, I'm sorry, they're not necessarily in, in a sequence, but uh, no if you'll address them the best you can. <laughs> Uh, one question we covered to some limited degree is when when it became apparent the U.S. was under attack, were there thoughts or plans of retaliation, mobilization of U.S. air power, uh, not only of scrambling, but retaliation and mobilization in general? Um, we began planning 
really examining what we had available for a military response. And of course, that requires the president to decide the Congress to authorize it as they did in the authorization of military. But, but we immediately began looking what assets we had, what assets we might reposition, what we knew about potential target sites, uh, target sets, you know, if, if asked to respond with uh, lethal force, what could we offer? Again, the Air Force doesn't do that as a headquarters that relies on the geographic combat commanders, in this case, US Central Command. And so, but we began looking at what we could bring to that fight and what we could do to be better prepared should such an authorization come. And that, uh, and that would focus on bombers <clears throat> carrying all manner of bombs, am I right? All of, all of our capabilities, yeah. bombers, fighters, and I'll just say all of our capabilities. Got it. Um, okay, let me let me go to some of this other. Yeah, you know, you must have been pulled in multiple directions. Um, this one questioner uh, viewer asks, uh, "How did you deal with the attack while simultaneously executing the the mission that was given to you? That must have pulled you in two separate directions." It, it did, but it's a matter of, you know, discipline, you know, how as, as I said, as a, in the military, if you don't practice discipline every day, you're not going to be able to do it when people are shooting at you. And they weren't shooting technically, but I thought it, we were well disciplined and uh, we divided up tasks and, and took care of business. And I told you I was going to force a story on you. Um, my daughter Yateng was, who later served in the Air Force in Iraq and Afghanistan, was 16 year old high school sophomore, miles from the Pentagon. She might have been a junior. Anyway, um, a young lady. I couldn't talk to her for eight hours. Uh, she didn't know if her father was alive or dead. She knew the Pentagon had been attacked. When you I were asked on her lockdown. She, you weren't supposed to call her. Well, I, I was busy. And you couldn't get a cell call anyway. I, you know, I was doing my job. Um, and she knew that she we had flown combat from from home uh, during Kosovo at, Ella, at Aviano Air Base, and she I asked her when I finally talked to her how she learned, and uh, she said they made an announcement, got people in the auditorium at her school, and she said kids were crying and screaming because they had TV on, and I I asked asked her, um, well did you cry? And she said, Dad. What good would that have done? Ah. Now, she's an extraordinary human being and a great so. person and leader. But I mean, that's kind of the approach. You you got work to do, so you do the work, and and you can have time for tears and fear and everything else later. But we had work to do, and everybody did it. I, I'm telling my story because it's my story. But there was no chaos. There was no panic. Um, we did our jobs. Okay, how did you deal with um, the incoming messaging, incoming media? You know, you had public response, media response yeah. uh, that you had to be familiar with. You had <laughs> internal response and communications among the, you know, components of the Pentagon. Um, and you had various options on the table with various people commenting and uh, offering counsel and advice and all these. Yeah. I mean, it's, the communications must have been flying around you internally, externally, reports and messaging galore, no? Well, thankfully, the media response per se was not my job. I mean, it's an important job, and, and but my, my role as crisis action team director in, in those first moments was to figure out what was true, what might be true, and what was false because of this avalanche of reports and information. And I did something I'd learned as a wing commander in combat when one of my aircraft was shot down. We just got every whiteboard we could find, portable whiteboard, and had people transcribe reports on the whiteboard. And if it got to the point where it might be true, we'd underline it. If it was true, we'd circle it. And if it wasn't, we'd line it out. And that was the only way to kind of sort through, are there three more hijacked airplanes over California? which I think was one of the reports. Mm -hmm. um, it, and so you're just parsing information, eliminating the obvi obviously incorrect 
false, er erroneous um, first reports, and then sift, trying to sift up, if you will, to what is true. And that was, you know, that's a, a intellectual endeavor. There requires a lot of analysis and verification, all that stuff. Critical thinking too, yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things you mentioned a minute ago is that you were prepared or considering uh, the possibility of deploying resources to Central Asia. Um, at, at some point, any point during that day, did you become aware, did the Air Force become aware um, that the origin of these uh, uh, terrorists was in Central Asia? Um, I, I don't remember, Jay, when, when we knew. I think it was quite early, and I think it was that day. I think that speculation about Afghanistan had started. Heck, I'd been in Rawalpindi, Pakistan in 1988 when a big ammo dump where we were shipping stingers blew up. Um, so, you know, we had, so many of us had awareness of the threat. There'd been a previous strikes and interests on Al Qaeda and bin Laden's assets that hadn't worked. And of course, previous terror attacks. So I think it happened pretty quickly, but I can't, I can't tell you at X o'clock we knew. And attribution was not our, not, it was a concern, but not our first concern. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, uh, that um, these these planes had been hijacked. They'd been flown, at least in New York and obviously in the Pentagon, into a building intentionally. That that mm -hmm. was that was clear to everyone in the world. Um, but did you think was there concern about the fact that these terrorists had been trained to fly the planes? Did that scenario, um, you know, pop up in the discussions? Was it considered? Was it relevant? It was not relevant uh, to on that day. You know, that's the forensic work to figure out how this happened, and it wasn't relevant because it, it would have been, it would have been relevant had the question been, is there going to be another plane? But there was no more flying. You know, the entire airspace was cleared. All the planes were grounded. They eventually, I don't know when we returned to some air uh, carrier operations, but at the moment, I don't care if they're trained pilots because there are no planes yeah. is I, the matter. And that was the point of grounding all air traffic um, because uh, if there was another plane, it would have been among that air traffic. If there is no air traffic, then all, yeah. then uh, further, further that, attacks are minimized. Yeah. yeah, or and and that that still to me is one of the most remarkable undertakings in my military history, and it was a civilian military effort. The FAA, Canada's airports and airspace managers, it, it it's miraculous, and it happened quite rapidly. Yes, I remember. Okay, so so there you are, and you see you see what happened uh, in the World Trade Center. You, you you see what happened in the Pentagon, and ultimately uh, you see what happened in, in uh, Flight ninety three in Shanksville. Um, I, you know, was there a reaction? Uh, did you have a reaction? Were others around you reacting to say, "Wait a minute, how could this happen? Um, what about our intelligence uh, capabilities?" Why didn't we know this? You know, the Air Force and the military in general, you know, is uh, in, inextricably intertwined, intertwined with um, intelligence. And I imagine um, a senior officer would say to himself, uh, wait a minute, why didn't we know this? Did you say that? Uh, of course, I think everybody did, but not perhaps with the same tone you're describing, because uh, again, what good would that do to quote my daughter? we need to know how it happened so it didn't happen again. And, um, you know, there was anger, of course, uh, anger at the perpetrators and all that, but, you know, you've got to focus on, on a rational response to the intelligence failings. Um, and I'd submit that in retrospect, some of our responses were not rational uh, intelligence-wise. I think we overdid it. It, it, it's now clear that if we had had simply better communication between CIA and FBI about activity they knew very well of in Kuala Lumpur before the attacks, 
the attacks could have been prevented. You didn't mention so, the Air Force itself, though, Dan. I mean, is the Air Force responsible for um, having intelligence on this? Is part of the intelligence effort uh, to defend against this kind of attack handled within the Air Force? And was there a discussion about that, whether it was handled or it should have been handled or, or should be handled that way in the future? Well, there is a lot of discussion about that, but the Air Force's role is, a, is military intelligence. Internally, uh, we have the Office of Special Investigations, which has a counterintelligence role, just like I think uh, NCIS does and Army CID. But that's, that's not our focus. That's the job of the FBI, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency to some degree, National Security Agency, CIA externally to the United States. So it's a matter of roles and responsibilities. Um, so our, it, it, it's not that we didn't look deeply inward. It, it's that that problem existed outside the primary purview of Air Force intelligence. Does, does the Air Force share intelligence with the other intelligence agencies? No, not at all. Of course we do. <laughs> and I'm not making light of it because intelligence sharing is, is challenging, but of course. And, um, and there's a significant Air Force presence in uh, intelligence related functions outside the Air Force. So there's, there is good interconnectivity. There's simply a, a breakdown in communication between a couple of other agencies. I, I work closely with intelligence agencies in a, in a variety of jobs that I had. That's about all detail I can go into, but yeah, there's good connectivity. We, we don't operate in isolation. Okay, uh, moving on to the last question we received from a viewer, which uh, is an interesting question. And I preface it by saying, you know, even now today, there is the possibility of um, of documents that that may uh, that may shine a, a dark light on Saudi Arabia <clears throat> as a party who knew or was some some way um, responsible or could have stopped this um, attack. After all, uh, lest we forget, Osama bin Laden was from Saudi Arabia. Lest we forget also that uh, the Saudi Arabian delegation was permitted to leave or spirited out of the country immediately after the attack for reasons that were, in my observation, never made clear. So the question, you know, and then taking it also uh, from the point of view of the United States and the United States military has connections with other countries. <laughs> we bring their their people here for training and I guess for you know making friends, uh, good soft power relations and so forth. And one of the countries that we have dealt with over the years has been Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia pilot trainees uh, included. And I wonder if there was a relationship of any kind with Saudi or between Saudi or well, I don't wonder. A question has been posed here. What was the relationship? between Saudi Arabia and the Pentagon? Well, that's not necessarily between Saudi Arabia and the Pentagon. The Pentagon isn't a standalone organization, but we had forces deployed in and around Saudi Arabia. In fact, I served a tour uh, in Riyadh as the director of operations for our Joint Task Force Southwest Asia. We were actively at that time um, enforcing no-fly zones, and I believe so. <laughs> 2000 in 2001. So uh, we had a presence there. We had a training, some training activities, and of course, uh, many much of their military equipment was purchased from the U.S. As for the forensic look back at who knew what in Saudi Arabia and what role they played, um, I think that what needs to be done, uh, the outcome will be interesting, but it, the focus should always be on the future. What do we learn from that? What do we do? regarding our future relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The who shot John Grassy Knoll stuff, um, interesting and necessary, but it's far more important to focus on the future. I totally agree. So, um, so Dan, um, you know, you've had, a, you had a very interesting and, and um, diverse career in the Air Force, so I guess, 
one has to have a career like that to to reach three stars and to do the things you've done. But but query where where does this event, where does this particular day, and the mission in in the day fit in your career? And and part of that is mm. uh, you know how did it change you? How did it change your perspective of the Air Force and and terrorism and the world um, since then? Uh, I, I know it must have been important, but how important was it both at the day and after the day? Um, it was an important and emotionally significant day, and incredibly significant to the to the nation. You know, the Air Force it, you know, we, my experience had, had exposed me to the problem with terrorism. I had five former subordinates who were killed in the Kobar Towers bombing. Um, but uh, I, I just, you know, my personal experience in direct combat with the enemy in the Kosovo War was far more important. It was, you know, kind of what formed my, my beliefs about war and morality and the important aggressive pursuit of peace much more than September 11th. And I'm not trying to minimize it, but I'm just saying I go back to that is, is so it may have reinforced or modified, but, but it, it was another problem to solve. Yeah, one last question is um, this. Um, uh, you know, 9-11 left a big impression on me and everyone I know mm -hmm. at the time. And 20 years later, it became a time for remembering. And we've seen a lot of the media to help us remember, to make us remember, some of which has been pretty painful. Um, but I just wanted to ask you one last question. That is, uh, sure. what message would you leave with people about 9-11? Um, as I said on my figments yesterday, um, that revenge is a fool's errand. Uh, if there's anything, I'd say I remember the anger that we felt. And my, it manifested myself in my mind with wanting our enemies, the perpetrators, to have the same terror on their faces that those running from the tornadoes of dust and debris in New York City had on their faces. That's that's how I thought about it. But um, then vengeance isn't mine. And uh, we needed to think broadly about protecting not just our nation from attack, but also the liberties inherent to our system and and um and the long hunt for bin laden for example uh, i think became a matter of revenge the, the so uh, deal with the protect the nation realize that freedom brings risk and that we will never be a risk-free society and deal with it don't don't invite risk but don't waste our precious people and limited resources trying to make the world a place it will never be. Do our best but with purpose and principle and accept the risk of liberty. Thank you, Dan. Dan Figleaf, uh, three star retired Air Force general and host on Think Tech Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. I knew you get the last in. I, I love being a, a, a citizen journalist, as you call us, on your great platform. Thanks for having me, Jay. I hope this was helpful for some viewers. All Absolutely. viewers. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. Aloha.